control as well. I think he was out of his depth, largely because he had something there that was that um, could easily have been big, very, very big. He was being very cautious about what happens when you actually publish patents. If I had gone that route, then uh, the next thing is it's published and for the appropriate fee anybody in the world can buy the uh, copy of the patent and the unscrupulous ones would try and copy it and imitate it and it has to be fully set out. It isn't something where you just sketch it, it's got to be fully set out and uh, then anybody with an average intelligence would be able to reproduce. Morris had a problem. His material was worthless without identifying a clear use for it. If he wanted to capitalise on his invention, he'd have to divulge what was in it. We have a materials library with thousands of these samples in it. Most of them are not out there. They just haven't found their place in the world yet. Uh, we have, you know, shape memory alloys, we have magnetic liquids, and, and they've all been invented by people, and they haven't quite made it into our lives because they don't quite actually do something we all need, want and want to pay for but they're not to say they won't in the future. His end goal was to, in fact, get something like £10 billion pounds dumped on, um, on him so that he could just do it. No one's going to do that. I thought you said billion. <laughs> I did, oh, I did. did. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry, right. you wanted £10 billion. I've heard numbers of, of, of that mentioned. Morris's stubborn nature is perhaps best illustrated in this extraordinary clip from a 1994 BBC documentary. Here, his daughter, Carrie, responds to an off-the-cuff question from the programme makers. What would you do if it was your invention? I would try and sell it out to the best deal that I could get for it by contacting all the people that have been interested in Starlight up to now. And how would you do that? How would you actually deal with them? Being, being, being that you've been in all these high-powered meetings and see all these executives, how they try and deal with it. Well, I would have to make sure that I was paid for it fully first before they got anything. Before they got any formulation? Before they got any formulation. Money through the bank? Money through the bank. All signed up and all belonging to the family? Yeah, as long as we had the money, money in our hands, yes. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? What would you do with two, two million pounds? Do you, don't you think you've undersold it? Well, it would be better than nothing. Yeah, but not, not as good as ten. Well, you haven't got ten yet. He was a very controlling, argumentative person, but that's who he is. And I think if he wasn't the eccentric person, he wouldn't have invented it. He, he, was, he was the showman. And I think that is a very important part of any business that you try and grow, is you invent something and then you have to, you have to get people on board. Like All these investors, they have many different ways to spend their money and you have to convince them that yours, your material is going to be the best way to spend the money and you need bravado, you need a demo, and he had them. It's so brilliant, his egg demo is like, surely it's the best demo ever for a new material. <laughs> I can't think of a better one. He invented something, he had that mind, he had the ability to, to show it off and get people really excited about it. I just think he didn't have the business head, and that's, you know, to have all those in one person, that usually doesn't happen. Morris passed away in 2011. Some believe he took the secret of Starlight to the grave. That hasn't deterred others from trying to replicate it. The truth about Starlight is that it's something that you could potentially knock up forms of using a product which you can just you know, get um, in your own home. And you yourself have made a batch of starlight? I've made a batch of not what I call starlight, but I've knocked up something. Notice that it's getting red hot in the middle, and notice that I'm still in fact holding this metal plate. There's no gas produced. When I take it away, Yeah, it's warm, isn't it? It's, it's not red it's, hot by, it's any, by any stretch, yeah. This is made using regular household products. Carrie, do me a favour while you're there. Will you feed those other rabbits for me? I fed them yesterday. Well, feed them again today, will you? 
Morris's bounds would have been based upon what he had in his home at that point of time. So what I then did was to in fact say, right, in my home I've got this and that and that. If I do this and that, what does that lead to? Does it lead to in fact anything novel? What would a hairdresser have at home then? He'd have presumably hair gels, mousse, hairspray. Are we, are we close? Did he make wigs also? I believe he did, yeah. So he would have had glue and things too. Do you think that could have been used? Could have been. It's white, so it could be something as simple as a PVA glue. I'm not going to go down that path. <laughs> but if you look at uh, published papers, people have used PVA glue for these kind of applications. What's in Starlight? Can't tell you that. Not one ingredient? Nope. Is there PVA glue in it? Can't tell you that. You have a formula for it which your dad passed on to you. Just tell us where you're up to with that and what you want to try and do with Starlight. We do want to bring it to the open market. You should be able to buy it on a shelf. This is what we're trying to do, put it into paint so people can actually paint their own houses. First off, Lee, let me say that we're pleased to see the BBC taking up the story of Maurice Ward, whose amazing genius became groundbreaking research. Now we heard about a US company, Thermashield, through Keith Lewis. One of the partners in that firm first contacted Morris back in 2008 and bought the intellectual rights to Starlight in October 2013. That included notes, test reports, and samples from the Boeing and the White Sands tests. We've been in touch with Steve Menk from Thermashield and we asked him for an interview. He politely declined, saying the company was keeping a low profile until they were ready to launch the product but he did send us a video statement and some footage from their very own egg test. Thermoshield produced samples, repelled high-powered laser attacks at power densities far exceeding prior laser testing. Also an 18-year-old legacy sample from the Boeing test cycles sustained equivalent laser attacks without a mark, proving its performance stability over time. Steve talks about how they're looking to use Starlight for very similar applications as those identified by Morris, Nicky and others. In America, you've got a company called Thermashield that your mother and another sister sold them a formula. That formula isn't as good as what we've got. So you're it's saying you've got some sort of super strength? Yes. Starlight? Yeah. It's not about having it and putting it all together. You've got to put it together in certain stages. And if you don't know how to do that, it won't work. There are now many, many of these paints out there called intumescent paints. If you go looking for them on the internet, you'll see there are a lot of companies making a lot of money out of this. It already exists, Starlight, not as a name brand, but as, as a commercial entity, that paint exists. There are other paints, intumescent paints, similar to Starlight, on the market that people can go into shops and buy. Why would they go in and buy Starlight as opposed to one of those? Because Starlight will save your life. I know there's nobody else out there who has a formula like Starlight. Despite Nikki's claims, her formula is yet to make it to the market. Do you think it could ever get to the point then where we can go to a shop and buy Starlight? It would have to be a lot better than the competition for that business to grow, in my view. You need proper tests to be able to define that. If they can prove that, they, they are going to do really well. And I would really, I'm cheering. I'm cheering for them that that happens. <laughs> I've not heard of anything which has been, which is so momentous in its application. And I think I would have done. I think we all would have done if it was out there. These days, what people do is open source invention and get the rest of the world to innovate around it. And I think it'd be a great legacy for Morris if actually the invention was just open sourced and everyone could just play around with it. As we followed the story of Starlight, we found it impossible to separate it from the story of its enigmatic creator. We've heard accounts of Morris's ingenuity and showmanship, but we've also learned of his stubbornness 
and the frustrations of those who tried to work with him. So how should we remember Morris? The person who spots a new material at that moment of, of an accident, maybe, or, or, or because he's doing some experiments, uh, is, is a special person. And, you know, it is sad to me that that moment for Morris didn't end up with Starlight in all of our lives, and I think it could have. If you take all the materials away from, from the world, all this stuff around us, we're just naked animals, you know? Inventing materials and then creating civilization is, is that is what we do as humans. And uh, so uh, he was, you know, he was, he was as good as any on that front. In a way, the best thing about Starlight is, is, is the story itself of Morris. His story tells you that it's possible to do something very novel, very new in your own garage. <laughs> and of the fact that anyone can invent something that could change the world.